estimated if he persisted in his course. Finding that nothing could be done with the juries, they were discharged with a scathing rebuff from the judge, and then sitting as a committing magistrate, he commenced his task alone. He examined witnesses, made arrests in every quarter, and created a consternation in the camps of the saints, greater than any they had ever witnessed before, since Mormondom was born. At last accounts, terrified elders and bishops were decamping to save their necks, and developments of the most startling character were being made, implicating the highest church dignitaries in the many murders and robberies committed upon the Gentiles during the past eight years. Had Harney been governor, Cradlebow would have been supported in his work, and the absolute proof seduced by him of, of Mormon guilt in this massacre and in a number of previous murders would have conferred gratuitous coffins upon certain citizens, together with occasion to use them. But Cumming was the federal governor, and he, un he, under a curious pretense of impartiality, sought to screen the Mormons from the, dam the demands of justice. On one occasion, he even went so far as to publish his, poorest, his protest against the use of the U.S. troops in aid of Cradlebaugh's proceedings. Mrs. C. V. Waite closes her interesting detail of the Great Massacre with the following remark and accompanying summary of the testimony, and the summary is concise, accurate, and reliable. Quote, For the benefit of those who may still be disposed to doubt the guilt of Young and his Mormons in the transaction, the testimony is here collated and circumstances given which go not merely to implicate but to fasten conviction upon them by confirmations strong as proofs of holy writ. 1. The evidence of Mormons themselves engaged in the affair is shown by the statements of Judge Cradle Ba and Deputy U.S. Marshal Rogers. 2. The failure of Brigham Young to embody any, ac any account of it in his report as Superintendent of Indian Affairs. Also his failure to make any allusion to it whatever from the pulpit until several years after the occurrence. 3. The flight to the mountains of men high in authority in the Mormon church and state when this affair was brought to the ordeal of a judicial investigation. 4. The failure of the Deseret News, the church organ, and the only paper then published in the territory, to notice the massacre until several months afterward, and then only to deny that Mormons were engaged in it. 5. The testimony of the children saved from the massacre. 6. The children and the property of the immigrants found in possession of the Mormons, and that possession traced back to the very day after the massacre. 7. The statements of Indians in the neighborhood of the scene of the massacre. These statements are shown not only by Cradlebaugh and Rogers, but by a number of military officers and by J. Forney, who was, in 1859, superintendent of Indian affairs for the territory. To all these were such statements freely and frequently made by the Indians. 8. The testimony of R. P. Campbell, Captain the 2nd Dragoons, who was sent in the spring of 1859 to Santa Clara to protect travelers on the road to California and to, acquire, and to inquire into Indian depredations. Unquote. C. <clears throat> Concerning a frightful assassination that was that was never consummated. If ever there was a harmless man, it is Conrad Wigand of Gold Hill, Nevada. If ever there was a gentle spirit that thought itself unfired gunpowder and latent ruin, it is Conrad Wigand. If ever there was an oyster that fancied itself a whale, or a jack-o'-lantern confined to a swamp that fancied itself a planet with a billion-mile orbit, or a summer zephyr that dreamed itself a hurricane, it is Conrad Wigand. Therefore, what wonder it is that when he says a thing, he thinks the world listens, that when he does a thing, the world stands still to look, and that when he suffers, 
there is a convulsion of nature. When I met Conrad, he was superintendent of the Gold Hill Assay Office, and he was not only its superintendent, but its entire force. And he was a street preacher, too, with a mongrel religion of his own invention, whereby he expected to regenerate the universe. This was years ago. Here, latterly, he has entered journalism, and his journalism is what it might be expected to be, colossal to ear, but pygmy to the eye. It is extravagant, grand eloquence confined to a newspaper about the size of a double letter sheet. He doubtless edits, sets the type, and prints his paper all alone, but he delights to speak of the concern as if it occupies a block and employs a thousand men. Sometimes less than two years ago, Conrad assailed several people mercilessly in his little People's Tribune and got himself into trouble. Straight away he airs the affair in the Territorial Enterprise in a communication over his own signature, and I propose to reproduce it here in all its native simplicity and more than human candor. Long as it is, it is well worth reading, for it is the richest specimen of journalistic literature the history of America can furnish, perhaps. From the Territorial Enterprise, January 20th, 1870. A seeming plot for assassination miscarried. To the editor of the Enterprise, Months ago, when Mr. Sutro incidentally exposed mining management on the Comstock and, among others, roused me to protest against its continuance, in great kindness you warned me that any attempt by publications, by public meetings, and by legislative action aimed at the correction of chronic mining evils in Story County must entail upon me a business ruin, B, the burden of all its costs, C, personal violence, and if my purpose were persisted in, then D, assassination, and after all, nothing would be effected. Your prophecy fulfilling. In, a large, in large part, at least, your prophecies have been fulfilled. For A, assaying, which was well attended to in the Gold Hill Assay Office, of which I am superintendent, is consequence of my publications. In consequence of my publications has been taken elsewhere, so the president of one of the companies assures me. With no reason assigned, other work has been taken away. With but one or two important exceptions, our assay business now consists simply of the gleanings of the vicinity. B. Though my own personal donations to the People's Tribune Association have already exceeded $1,500 outside of our own numbers, we have received in money less than $300 as contributions and subscriptions for the journal. C. On Thursday last, on the main street in Gold Hill near noon, with neither warning nor cause assigned, by a powerful blow I was felled to the ground, and while down I was kicked by a man who it would seem had been led to believe that I had spoken derogatorily of him, but whom he was so induced to believe I am as yet unable to say, by whom he was so induced to believe I am as yet unable to say. On Saturday last I was again assailed and beaten by a man who first informed me why he did so, and who persisted in making his assault even more the erroneous who persisted in making his assault even after the erroneous impression un under which he also was at first laboring had been clearly and repeatedly pointed out. This same man, after fa failing through intimidation to elicit from me the names of our editorial contributors against giving which he knew me to be pledged, beat himself weary upon me with a rawhide. I not resisting, and then pantingly threatened me with permanent disfiguring mayhem, if ever again I should introduce his name into print, and who but a few minutes before his attack upon me assured me that the only reason I was, quote, permitted 
to reach home alive on Wednesday evening last, at which time the People's Tribune was issued, was that he deems me only half-witted, and be it remembered, the very next morning I was knocked down and kicked by a man who seemed to be prepared for flight. He sees doom impending. When will the circle join? How long before the whole of your prophecy will be fulfilled, I cannot say. But under the shadow of so much fulfillment in so short a time, and with such threats from a man who is one of the most prominent exponents of the San Francisco mining ring, staring, starring me in this whole community defiantly, staring me in this whole community defiantly in the face and pointing to a completion of your augury. Do you blame me for feeling this, that this communication is the last I shall ever write for the press, especially when a sense alike of personal self-respect, of duty to the, this money-oppressed and fear-ridden community of American fealty, to the spirit of true liberty, all command me, and each more loudly than love of life itself, to declare the name of that prominent man to be John B. Winters, president of the Yellow Jacket Company, a political aspirant and a military general, the name of his partially duped accomplice and a better in this last marvelous assault is no other than Philip Lynch, editor and proprietor of the Gold Hill News. Despite the insult and wrong heaped upon me by John B. Winters on Saturday afternoon, only a glimpse of which I shall be able to afford your readers, so much do I deplore clinching by publicity a serious mistake of any one man or woman committed under natural and not self-wrought passion in view of his great apparent excitement at the time and in view of the almost perfect privacy of the assault. I am far from sure that I should not have given him space for repentance before exposing him, were it not that he himself has so far exposed the matter as to make it the common talk of the town that he has horsewhipped me. The fact having been made public, all the facts in connection need to be also, or silence on my part would seem more than singular, and with many would be proof either that I was conscious of some unworthy aim in publishing the article, or else that my non-combative principles are but a convenient cloak, alike of physical and moral cowardice. I therefore shall try to present a graphic but truthful picture of this whole affair, but shall forbear all comments, presuming that the editors of our own journal, if others do not, will speak freely and fittingly upon this subject in our next number, and whether I shall then be dead or li living, for my death will not stop, though it may suspend the publication of the People's Tribune. The, quote, non-combatant sticks to principle, but takes along a friend or two of a conveniently different stripe. The trap set. You know, researchers with uh, severed heads and live scorpions. Well, this is why I had to leave the state.